Hi, I'm Chap Bettis, author of The Disciple Making Parent, and this is my audio blog, where I read some of my blog posts in audio format for your convenience. Well, in today's episode, we're going to be thinking about preventing destructive marital conflict. You know, conflict in marriage is a common issue, and it's not the sign of an unhealthy marriage. The goal is to not have a conflict-free marriage. The goal is to have healthy conflict. Healthy conflict builds a marriage. Unhealthy or destructive conflict can destroy a marriage. Well, what are some principles that can keep us from destructive conflict? I'd like to suggest the following. Number one, cultivate self-awareness. The rest of these principles will do no good if you're not aware of or if you're constantly excusing what comes out of your mouth. We must start with an ongoing awareness of what we say and micro-repentance for what we say sinfully. Proverbs 14.8 says, The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. And when words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. That's Proverbs 10.9. In both of those, there's a self-awareness of when they should speak. So, number one, cultivate self-awareness. Number two, cultivate humility correctability, and a desire to grow to be like Christ. We seek to live for an audience of one, no matter what the other party does. Becoming more holy and Christ-like means communicating in a more Christ-like way. Focus on your own growth in communication. Matthew 12, 36 says, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they have spoken. And Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. The point being that our spouse is sharpening us, and we, uh, on the day of judgment, we will give an account for what we have said. So number two, cultivate humility, correctability, and a desire to grow to be like Christ. Number three, identify and attack the problem, not the person. You know, it's easy to lose focus of the problem that's causing the conflict, and we can begin attacking the person. Sometimes this starts with a desire not to, to build a family or to resolve the conflict, but just to win. Often that means using sentences that start with you, you, you. We're attacking the motives of the other person or generalizing to the character or skipping to another problem. Stick to one conflict at a time. Ephesians 4.26 says, In your anger, don't sin. We want to, number three, identify and attack the problem, not the person. Number four, understand and then be understood. We want to seek to understand the conflict. What are the desires of the other person? Seek to listen to not only the words, but the heart beneath the words. Seek to understand not only the position, but also the interests or desires underneath it. I have a whole blog post on that, positions and interests. Well, Proverbs 20 verse 5 says, The purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, but a man of understanding draws them out, draws those purposes out. And Proverbs 18.2 says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his own opinion. And James 1.19 tells us that everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. All of those encourage us, number four, understand and then be understood. Number five, don't use reckless words, but use pleasant words. You know, we can choose inflaming words or calming words. So, for example, inflaming words would be, you never, you always. Again, Proverbs is helpful here. Proverbs 12, 18, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. That's Proverbs 12, 18. In Proverbs 16, 21, the wise in heart are called discerning and pleasant words promote understanding. We want to use pleasant words and not reckless words. So, number five, don't use reckless words, but pleasant words. 
Number six, respond to anger with gentleness. Or if you're the one given to anger, control that anger. That just goes without saying. Proverbs 15.1 tells us, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So we're to respond to anger with a gentle word. 1 Peter 3.9 says, Don't repay insult with insult, but with blessing. For to this you were called. And that applies in the home. 1 Peter 3.9. And Proverbs 29.11 says, A fool gives full vent to his anger. But a wise person keeps himself under control. We're not to give full vent to our anger. And I've already read it, but Ephesians 4, 26, in your anger, don't sin. Do not sin. So number six, we want to respond to anger with gentleness. Or if you're the one given to anger, control that anger. Number seven, cultivate a forbearing spirit that properly overlooks two things, sin and differences that are not sinful. So I want to suggest that we have a forbearing spirit that properly overlooks sin. There are times to properly overlook sin and and times to overlook differences that are not sinful. Why? Well, because Christ has overlooked and is overlooking much in you. So we don't want to be a nitpicking spouse, constantly trying to improve uh, our spouse. You know, it's possible to become a fault-finding, quarrelsome person. And we need to give grace for a person who does things differently than us, a different person who does things differently. There certainly are times to really challenge each other, but there's also a time just to forbear. Romans 15, 7 says, Accept one another as Christ has accepted you. So Christ has accepted so much in me and in you. Accept the other person. 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all, love one another deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers over a multitude of sins. And Proverbs 25, 24, It's better to live in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared by a quarrelsome wife. That's Proverbs 25, 24. So we want to cultivate a forbearing spirit that properly overlooks two things, sin and differences that are not sinful. Well, on my website, I have a table that I got from Family Life Ministries. It's really helpful. So let me read through this. So when we're having a disagreement, we want to focus on one issue rather than many issues. We want to focus on the problem and not the person. We want to focus on behavior and not character. We want to focus on specifics and not generalizations. We want to focus on facts and not judgment of motives. We want to focus on I statements and not you statements. Finally, we want to focus on understanding instead of who's winning or who's losing. An eighth principle is call fouls on yourself when you sin. And what do I mean by that? Well, in a pickup basketball game, there are certain rules of the game that both parties know and abide to. And, and fouls will happen. That's understandable. And without a referee, it's incumbent on each person to admit their own fouls. You know, if you don't admit the fouls, or maybe you want to play by football rules and not basketball rules, well, the game is over. Similarly, when one party breaks the above communication principles, then they have to admit it and confess it. It's a matter of honor before the Lord. So call fouls on yourself when you sin. Matthew 5, 48 says, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. So we want to hold ourselves to that standard. Luke 6, 31 says, do unto others as you would have them do to you. And James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. In Matthew 5, Jesus tells us, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And that even applies sometimes if things might be rough in the home. So number eight, call fouls on yourself. Number nine, don't go to bed angry. Move toward each other. Don't try and resolve issues late at night, but release it and work on it later. So I've written more about that in the post, should you let your son go down on your anger. Ephesians 4, 26, which I've already read, don't let the sun go down on your anger 
and do not give the devil a foothold. So number nine, don't go to bed angry. Number 10, choose the right time, place, and procedure. Don't try and have a $100 conversation in a 25-cent minute. Think about when to talk about things. Set aside time like a coffee date. Don't bring up things just because it's on your mind. Add margin to your life so that you have time to talk. So don't always be rushing. Number 10, choose the right time and place and procedure when you're going to have a discussion. Number 11, when these are broken, reflect on the conflict and seek to grow. So certainly there's going to be sinful conflicts, but journal or reflect on the triggers and how you could have responded differently to calm the quarrel. What will you do differently next time? Because <laughs> probably there will be a next time. Proverbs 26, 18 says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. We don't want to repeat our folly. We don't want to be a fool. In Proverbs 14, 8 says, the wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. So let's give thought to our way. So these rules, these principles are broken, reflect on the conflict and seek to grow. And number 12, seek outside help freely. You know, we give to our spouses protection, but not secrecy. And I have a blog post on that. We're commanded to go and get help when we need it. Family secrets are not excluded from that command. The body of Christ is meant by God to help us. Proverbs 15, 22 says, Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. And of course, Matthew 18, 15 to 16 says, If your brother sins against you, go to him. And if he'll not listen to you, bring one or two others along. Well, so seek outside help freely. And finally, we'll give you a baker's dozen here. Number 13, stop, drop, and pray for unity. You know, many disagreements could be resolved if one party said to the other, Hey, let's just stop and ask for the Lord's help right now. So turning the focus from the other to the Lord and crying out for insight and help can calm many disagreements. So if you grew up on the phrase stop, drop, and roll, if things are on fire, I'm changing that to stop, drop, and pray for unity. Well, today's post is one of many on living the gospel out in the home. You know, the home is the hardest place to live out the gospel, and yet we're living before our children and before the Lord. So if you'd like to learn more to become equipped in living out the gospel at home, visit our website at thedisciplemakingparent.com. And don't forget to leave us a rating or review. That really helps out and helps the podcast providers know that this is making an impact. And while you're there, who could you recommend this podcast to? Well, I'm Chad Bettis. Thanks for listening.